There we go. Very good. Okay, I can see you fine, and uh, we're ready to go. So um, our guest today is uh, Ed Larson, Edward J. Larson, Pulitzer Prize winner, and your new book is Faith on Faith and Science that you co-authored with uh, the philosopher of science, Michael Ruse. And uh, so I think... Um, uh, before we get into the, the meat of this, this is you know one of the great topics, of course, of much interest to humanists, atheists, skeptics, freethinkers, and, and, and the like, and religious people too, of course. Um, but uh, you are a professor at Pepperdine University, and uh, you know I'm I'm matriculated there. I am a member of the very first four-year graduating class of the Malibu campus, 1976, and uh, I have fond memories of living in Malibu <laughs> and thinking I'll probably never live here again. <laughs> and you live there, so that's pretty cool. Um, but you do a lot of historian uh, history of science, but you're a law professor, right? So how do those uh, those two um, congeal? Oh, I have a joint appointment. I have a PhD in the history of science. Uh, in fact, you you may I know you know my major professor Ron Numbers, right? The next on creationism and history of of creationism, uh, as well as a law degree. And so I've always held uh, everywhere I've been. I was at Georgia for twenty years. I was chair of the history department. Um, here I have I'm the university professor of history, as well as having a chair in the law school. So. Traditionally, I taught a course in the law school on science law and, and issues involving uh, medical law and science law. Um, I've moved on to other things, but uh, I am very much a history professor. I teach uh, the capstone course for the American Studies master's degree here at Pepperdine at, at Georgia. As I said, I was both chair of the history department and also uh, that for a long time, I used to joke that I held down, because I was the only historian of science for a while, the whole settee in the history of science, <laughs> but now I'm, uh, now I'm here. So I'm both a history professor and a law. How they combine, though, you ask a deeper question. And I used to get that a lot when I was in grad school. When I was in grad school at University of Wisconsin, which was then the top-ranked program in history of science, at least I thought it did, that's why I chose to go there over other options, was that... Um, uh, jobs were tight, just as they are now. They got better in between, but they were very tight for historians of science. Not many people, you know, historic history departments as they are now were cutting back, and they were diversifying. So they were getting more African historians, more Asian historic historians, and less historians of science. It was viewed by many in the mainstream of history as being the story of dead white males, <laughs> and that was not the, in, the field to carry. Uh, so uh, I was advised as it were because i was interested in the interfakes i was already working on the creation evolution legal controversy which was my dissertation the history of the creation uh, uh evolution legal controversy in america which was published as trial and error by by um, the oxford university press i had a lot of law and law was going to be my minor at university of uh, uh, wisconsin and i was advised wisely uh that if you have a it's tough to get jobs in history of science. So if you have more diversity, if you can show expertise. And what I could do was there are lots of questions, not just creationism, that involve an interface of science and law that hit the courts, whether it be patent law, or genetic engineering, um, eugenics, a whole bunch of topics. And if I could sort of, and I was focused on the history of biology and the life science, and if I could draw those two together, I might have a niche that even somebody of my limited ability could could <laughs> leverage into a position. Uh, and it turned out I was the first person in a historian in a biology degree to get a job in three years when I came out. And that was in Georgia. But I got it, it certainly helped that I also had a law degree from Harvard. So it's and it has helped me professionally or my research and analysis because I could tape a copy a uh, topic like the Scopes trial and I could understand what was happening at the law aspect of it, same way with the Dover trial. I could understand the legal maneuvering as well as the scientific, or hope to understand the scientific maneuvering and the religious maneuvering, and that provided a leg up for what I could appreciate happening because some of the stuff that happens in a courtroom in Scopes or in Dover has really voiced upon it by the legal procedures and legal mechanisms, and if you can get through that, you can get down to the meat. So. To me, they have, as a niche field, they've worked well. 
Yeah, indeed. In fact, um, your uh, new book intersects with this uh, a fair amount throughout history. But the, the book you won the Pulitzer Prize for, Summer of the Gods, uh, that, that de- delves deep into the uh, legal aspects of the Co- Scopes trial, much of which I didn't know. I think most people don't know. Uh, you know, it's been portrayed, uh, you know, say before the 1980s as this, you know, epic battle between science and religion and and, uh, and so forth. And, and so much of it was set up uh, to challenge uh, as a legal challenge. Uh, the ACLU was relatively new in, in the early 1920s. These laws were being passed for um, anti uh, te- against the teaching of evolution. The ACLU was shopping around for a place uh, to uh, challenge the law. Scopes was, I guess, he was a substitute teacher, right? He wasn't even the regular biology teacher, and 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 so on and so forth. I, I remember encountering this initially before I read your book uh, a decade before with Gould's writings. He, I think, he wrote a few essays in natural history on this, and uh, including stuff about William Jennings Bryan that I didn't know. Uh, you know. Why would a progressive like him be against uh, the theory of evolution? And that links back to this uh, social Darwinism and his uh, reading of of some of the literature of social Darwinists and and how nationalistic they were and racist they were. And that sort of turned him off to the theory. And and that Scopes actually, um, he didn't technically lose, right? I mean, he was fined $100 and any fine over $50 had to be levied by a jury, not a a judge. And so the whole thing got thrown out. Uh, on appeal and and you know there's all this background stuff that goes on that most people don't know about and of course that's not in the the inherit the wind uh, film and and uh, so I, I think much of the work that uh, historians of science do is show how nuanced and complicated these stories are when you actually look into them like the Galileo case and it's never quite that simple absolutely and um, Gould was uh, he was there when I was at Harvard and he helped inspire me talking with him uh, he's a, he was a tremendously insightful man. Uh, whatever one m- might think of all of the details of his theories in geology, he was a tremendous humanist and a tremendously insightful man. And his um, his comments on the Scopes trial helped me realize that there was a much richer and broader story to be told, and he had just sort of tapped on little ends of it. And that helped inspire me to go in deeply into the Scopes trial, which was, of course, my third book. And... Um, and in addition to all the things you say, the, the nature of the law drives the nature of the controversy, of the creation evolution controversy. Let me try to explain. You have to have a litigable issue. Uh, just the other day, the, the, the reapportionment case was struck down in, 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 in uh, Wisconsin. It had nothing to do with the substance of partisan gerrymandering. It had all to do with the esoteric issues of, of standing. So that's why in America today, or at least with Dover or with Aguillard or with Epperson, um, that struck down the, the equal time laws or the, the anti-evolution laws in the last 50 years, 60 years, they could be brought on issues of separation of church and state because we have a First Amendment that bars the uh, government from promoting religion. Now, you couldn't do that in the Scopes case trial, which nobody understands when I talk about it, because back then the First Amendment ban on religious um, establishment did not apply to states. At least the court didn't interpret it to it that. Justice Thomas doesn't, still doesn't want it to, and if he gets control of the court, they may open the door to all this stuff. Mm. But see, that's what makes it interesting. You've got to frame your arguments in a in a legal context because we can't bring a case saying oh you can't teach um creation science because it's bad science because there's nothing in the constitution that bars teaching bad science right we have to frame it a certain way and so darrow and the the prosecution of the defense at scopes the aclu had to defend it on vague and esoteric issues of academic freedom that weren't very well established and freedom of speech which also and they mostly had to bring it under the Tennessee uh, uh, Constitution, which had a weird provision that the legislature was supposed to cherish science. Now, I wish our U.S. Constitution cherish. <laughs> I'd love to have uh, Justice people like Justice Brennan start issuing on that, um, or Justice Breyer. But so you had to bring it in certain ways. We have to bring it in other ways. We can bring it in other ways today. If they narrow the interpretation of 
of establishment clause, such as Clarence Thomas wants them to, it'll cut off certain avenues, and they know that. In contrast, in other countries, like Cal one Canadian province once adopted a balanced treatment act, one Australian state, Queensland once did, um, in those states, the Netherlands funds creationist instruction in certain um, publicly supported schools. They don't have a idea of anti-establishment clause, so they have to bring court challenges in a whole different way. So you can only understand what's happening in these cases and how they have to be constructed um, if you understand the law, and that's what I try to bring to the story. And the issue is that they're public schools, therefore they're tax-funded, therefore the government has some say in what's going on there. In America, they do under the Constitution. In places like England, they do um, directly by the parliament. So you have different um, different bodies with different controls, and so you have to attack the issues in different ways. Um, there's always the fear that the, the, the First Amendment will be radically cut back. The protections of the Establishment Clause will be radically cut back, and the protections of the so-called Free Exercise Clause will be radically expanded. That's what we're seeing in some of these decisions. And it's it's right now the court's fascinating because it's a it's a five four split with um, Justice Kennedy sort of you know staying on the right side tipping the balance but one um, one retirement could change everything right so uh, in the, and in the case of Scopes um, it was not against the law for him to teach evolution the theory only when it applies to to humans right correct. Correct. The statute, because of Brian's personal concerns, and Brian was behind the statute, he had lobbed, he had, he was behind the whole movement, and he had personally lobbied in Tennessee. His, his concern, and this was before, um, before you had the rise of Henry Morris and the notions of young earth creationism um, of modern day. Back then, if you looked at the fundamentalist of the era, and fundamentalists, brand new term at that time, as you know, um, the fundamentals of the era, they tended to accept so-called reconciliation of the Genesis account and and at least at least an ancient Earth right. by something known as the Day Age theory and the Gap theory, which were in the Schofield Reference Bible and which Brian believed. The one thing he held separate, and you were absolutely right, it was partly on his his social views that humans themselves were different. That humans, the Bible, it could be a that, as he said on the stand in in Dayton, that the Earth could be six thousand years old, it could be sixty thousand years old, it could be six hundred million six hundred million years old. That's what he said. Um, it doesn't matter to me. All I care about is that humans were directly created in God's image. That's what we need to defend because he didn't. He had this. He had this belief that uh, that um, from reading people like Carnegie and hearing about Rockefeller and reading about the German uh, militarists during World War One that they were all motivated. The robber barons and the and the German militarists were, and the British militarists to that extent, to some extent were motivated by a survivalist, the fittest sort of Spencerian thought. And right. it truly was much more Spencerian than it ever was Darwin. Right. And therefore, he did not want that taught. Well, as he initially said, he didn't want it taught as true in public schools, but Tennessee went further than that, and they said you can't teach it at all. Right. Yeah, I mean, we tend to, to look, look down upon creationists as something like ignorant, uneducated yahoos. But really, from their point of view, uh, they have an argument to make. That is, you know, if we're talking about public schools, let's say I'm living in a little community and there are no private schools to send my kid to, so he has to go to the public school. And I don't care if they teach about geology or whatever, but w once they go down this road of, you know, humans evolve, there is, maybe that leads the kids to believe there's no God, and if there's no God then there's no morality, there's no basis for a civil society, and all of a sudden my kid's being indoctrinated, that's my job to teach my kid morality, not your job right. as a public school teacher. So just leave that part out of it. 
Uh, it's almost like the you know teaching sex education in school and teaching kids how to use condoms with the banana and all that stuff. Hey, buddy, that's my job at home, not your job. And so they're in that borderlands of you know to to what extent are public schools getting involved in moral issues? You can kind of see, given the background of how Darwinian theory was misused, uh, why some parents might get concerned about that and then try to legislate it. I. I agree with you. And that's the way Brian thought. But that's I do want to add that that's how he really differs from Henry Morris, who founded the Christian Institute for Christian Research and the modern young earth creationism, but also Dwayne Gish and, and Kent Ham. Because and they're very explicit about this. It's an acts and facts. It's it's in fact the title of one of his books. What they did to raise money and what they said, and I, and I believe from talking to Henry Morris that he believed this in his heart. He didn't just want to go as far as you were saying, Brian's argument. Let's just leave the issue out. Brian didn't want creationism taught in public schools because he thought, um, being a progressive Democrat, he thought that would have the same ill effects as, as teaching evolution, as you describe it. But with, with Morris, he made the clear argument that creation science is the, um, the cutting edge. That was the name of one of his books. The cutting edge of of uh, of of evangel evangelizing people, he wanted affirmatively to get creation science into the classroom. That's why he pushed for balanced treatment, as opposed to uh, just Brian's old cure of just not teaching evolution, because he wanted if he believed and he said and he said to me personally, he said to Ron Numbers, he also wrote in books publicly. He used it to raise funds. If we can get people to believe in in creationism, well, then they inevitably will believe in literal Christianity. They'll believe in the Bible because it will just logically follow. So it's the cutting edge of evangelizing people. Now, I find I especially found that humorous um, because for two things, for practical reasons, not the humorous part yet. For practical reasons, I used to do an enormous amount of research on this topic. I've written many books. I've written many articles on the uh, on on creationism and it's and it's um, and it's um, oh I don't know what you'd say creationism and, and its um, uh, impacts and 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 evolution and development. And I've interviewed on, I've talked with enormous numbers of creationists, and I've never ever in my entire life, whether they be scientists like Fritz Schaefer at Georgia or or laymen or doctors or I've never heard a single one say they came to creationism first and then came to fundamentalist or evangelical Christianity. The pattern is always the ver- reverse. Right. They come first. They have a like like um, Bill Johnson. They come first for a variety of social, personal, yep. whatever yeah. reasons. They come to religion and then they take on the baggage. Then they come to creationism. So first, I've never seen it practically as the cutting edge. And I asked Henry Morris for examples or Dwayne Gish, um, and they couldn't give me any. And then the, the other thing was when I was over in, in, in Islamic countries um, lecturing or teaching or winning, I found that they widely use Henry Morris's textbooks. He writes textbooks right. for, for schools, um, creationists from a creationist viewpoint. And they're widely used in Islamic countries, or at least they were. Uh, I assume they still are uh, translated into whatever language they are. And I just think that's so funny because it's sort of ironic because he is such a deep Christian. He was such a deep Christian. And he so much wanted to evangelize to Christianity. And the thought that he was happily letting his book being used for (laughs) Muslims just just struck me or reinforced Islam just struck me as as uh, uh, as as just precious so from a purely pragmatic argument uh, in terms of evangelizing for Jesus teaching young earth creationism as an avenue to get people to um, uh, you know, to come to Christ it doesn't work that's not the way to do it well it, it doesn't seem in practice that that's the example that happened Right. Yep. 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 So, um, and and that does bring uh, to mind this transition from this sort of older William Jennings Bryan style of 
treating some of these arguments as metaphors, like the six days, it could be a gap in between each day could be a thousand years or a billion years, who knows, uh, versus today's, or at least in the last few decades, creationist argument that actually has to be literally true. And we usually think of that as fundamentalists, and, but that word fundamental comes from that, that series of books in the early 20th century, I forget, like maybe 1910s, the fundamentals. Uh, did those books uh, emphasize the literal reading of every word and passage in the Bible, or is that a much later uh, a misinterpretation of what Christians at the time believed? Well, the fundamentals, the books, they were funded by a bunch, a couple of oil uh, millionaires from Southern California, <laughs> and they were part, an early opening wedge. There were a series of booklets that came out over a period of years, printed in huge volumes and sent out to past um, re uh, preachers and, and laymen around the country to try to push the, um, uh, the fundamentalist side, the evangelical side, maintaining the, the truth of the, 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 the scriptures against higher criticism. And uh, they, were, they had a variety of authors. So what they did is they went and recruited a whole variety of theologians, and, and they weren't all theologians. Some were doctors, some were, but in some way, public intellectuals, if they weren't theologians, who tried to work on the conservative side, to try to push that side, they wanted to have a diverse array so they could reach into the Episcopal Church, they could reach into the Presbyterian Church, they could reach into the Northern Baptist Church, as, because that's where the battle was being drawn then, and all these denominations were then dividing between the so-called modernists and the so-called fundamentalists. And they had a variety of viewpoints. This was certainly not fixed. You can see some of these tracts being written by pretty strict, pretty strict doctrines of, of interpretation of Genesis. But that was not dominant. And there were pure theistic evolutionists, one that ex some of the writers, like James Orr, who was Scottish, accepted a, 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 a evolutionary viewpoint that God was simply guiding this evolutionary process, um, but it was common origins, um, common descent. So you can go all the way from that to sort of a midline position that would be um, that God created humans, but other things were open, others that would long earth. This was not a, this was not a major topic. In, in, you have to go in and look right. for the articles right. written by science or science-related people or theologians that raise it. Most of the issues were the direct divinity of Christ, the virgin birth. These were the main issues. What happened is, over time, following this, World War I came, uh, Ryan hopped on the bandwagon, uh, some, some evolutionary professors from um, Stanford, Vernon Kellogg and, and, and David Starr Jordan, picked up on this issue. They were pacifists, and they went over and tried to figure out why does such a sophisticated scientific country like Germany get involved in World War I, and they heard some people talking about uh, survival of the fittest, and their doctrines were superior to the, 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 the democratic doctrines of England and, and uh, the United States, and of course that boiled Brian blood. And so you had this became more prominent as issue. It would certainly be secondary in the fundamentals. Then the name, The Fundamentals, which were in that booklet, happened to be picked up by um, William Bell Riley, who was probably the leading evangelical spokesman or fundamentalist spokesman of the day. And he formed the World's Christian Fundamentals Organization, I mm. think, in 1918. It was based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It was later picked up by Billy Graham and became the Billy Graham Association. But the, originally... Supposed to be a counter of the national, then called the National Council of Churches, which was viewed as leaning toward modernism. This was, and churches would join it, and he was a charismatic speaker. And that name, it was, it was picked up there. And then Curtis Law, um, I'm trying to think of his full name. Uh, somebody, an, a journalist, picked it out of that World's Christian Fundamentalist and coined the term the fundamentalists or mm. fundamentalists in, in, yeah, I think it was 1919, and it just stuck because it seemed, right. to, it seemed to apply. Brian occasionally used it. When it first came out, he said, 
He'd always called himself an evangelical. He said, yeah, I'm one of those too. I'm a fundamentalist too. But he didn't, he didn't really stick to that because it very quickly acquired um, more of a negative um, connotation and evangelicals was seen as a little broader. So even Brian's use was mixed. But certain people who were more conservative than Brian, they just they just clung to it, and right. they uh, it became their new name. There seems to be a sense I get from pe- talking to people like Ken Ham and and, and Bill Dembski and and uh, uh, Paul Nelson and some of the others I've debated that if they give up even uh, I- anything as metaphorical, a day is really a day. Or, you know, Jesus was resurrected. He was really literally resurrected. It's not a metaphor or the flood or no, uh, you know, or, or, or you know, any of the stories that it's a slippery slope down the road to giving up uh, belief that there are real objective moral values. Mm-hmm. And, and, and once you get far down that road, you've lost the basis of civil society. And it, it seems to me, having been to the, when I visited the, the, Kentucky Creationist Museum, you know, you go down those two pathways and the one leads you to this dark room with abortion and euthanasia and sex, drugs and rock and roll and, you know, and so on. And, you know, that seems to be where they're going. Like if we give up way back, you know, with Adam and Eve, then this is where you're going to end up. So they're, they're, you know, the line in the sand for them is, you know, right there, Genesis 1-1. We have to start right there and don't let the, the scientists tell us anything other than what we know to be true. Certainly that was Henry Morris, who in so many ways was the founder of this whole uh, movement. I know Ron Numbers likes to point to um, um, Henry Price, who was a a, a Seventh-day Adventist who started pushing all these ideas back in the 1920s. But in reality, the evangelical Christians didn't think much of the Seventh-day Adventists. They thought they were a, a, a cult because they believed in added teachings added later by their founder. Uh, and so that they distrusted him. So it was, it was really Henry Morris more than anyone. And it's amazing how much impact one, one, um, engineering professor, um, <laughs> at Virginia tech can have with his book, the Genesis flood. But well, yeah, that was 1950s, right? It, it came out, I think, in 61. He wrote it in the 50s and shopped for a while. He wrote it with John Whitcomb, who was a, um, uh, a fundamentalist theologian. But he would say, what he'd say is, you, you either believe the Bible or you don't. And if you give up on Genesis, you're ultimately going to give up on Revelation. Um, if you give up on Genesis, you're going to give up on on Jesus, how can you believe one thing in it and and not another? In contrast, of course, um, not just William Jennings Bryan, but probably but countless Christians from Saint Augustine on have had absolutely no trouble. Right. Some of it typologically or metaphorically. So, what was the cultural or, backdrop? Uh, uh, what was the cultural backdrop of America for this to take? root like that is it is it sputnik the f- the fear of you know we're, we're we're falling behind in science and therefore there's a push for the teaching of darwin and then a push back by these creationists and so there was a there was a milieu that it could drop into that didn't take hold say in the 20s and 30s that in the 60s and 70s and then ended up in these court cases in the 70s and 80s uh, where that, uh, and we're still at to a certain extent uh, of this kind of literal. There has to be a way for not not non overlapping magisteria, but that no 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 the science has to support our religious beliefs or else we're doomed. You know that's one of the sixty four dollar questions that everyone asks, um, and I don't think there's a complete answer. I think everything you've said is part of it. I do think that there is a growing. Uh, well, as Hofstetter said, the an- American an- anti-intellectualism. There is a, a, there's always been that sense that Americans don't trust experts. It can go all the way back to Andrew Jackson. Mm-hmm. It can go all the way back to the, the beginning. There's always been a nature of con- Americans have been conspiracy theorists. Mm-hmm. It goes back to uh, Patrick Henry and James and George Mason, um, and I'm sure it goes before that. So there's always this sense there is in um, evangelical Christianity, this sense that Brian definitely 
because Brian was a populist, that we all have, you know, that everyone has equal access for truth. And there's there's no experts, especially in the Bible, because the Holy Spirit will guide us. And the Holy Spirit will, will illumine lines far beyond what you can get from Shaler Matthews or any other, um, or a German theologian. And so there's always that aspect. What made it take off more in the 50s? Um, it, it could have been the that negative side of science, that after the, the, the atomic bomb mm-hmm. and everything that science seemed to deduce, to deduce us, so fearful of it, that we're not going to trust these people anymore. It could also be where science before had a, among experts, had a, had a higher uh, respect. So that, that certainly could be part of it. It could be the um, general breakdown of institutions and the rise of, of, of fundamentalist churches that didn't have the, the mass expansion of fundamentalist churches, mega churches that, that don't have a requirement that their pastors go to uh, seminaries, that their pastors are just called to this job, and most of them only have a Bible school education. Mm-hmm. And then they become a megachurch. Um, the breakdown of denominations, you don't have a hierarchy where the uh, Presbyterian church or the, the Episcopal church can impose some sort of a of a of doctor, or the Methodist church still does, doctrine down, but rather anything goes in these individual um, distinctive churches. Those are all, so it could be part of that. It could be just generally the... Um, growing sense of every individual wants to make their own decisions. And also, not only did science become more fearful, but it became more complex. If you were a a generally educated person, a banker, a doctor, a lawyer, a William Jennings Bryan, you could pretty well get your idea, your head around most scientific theories Mm -hmm. during the 1800s. You could basically get your head around how evolution works. You could get your head around um, Cuvier's theories of an ancient earth. You could get your theory, ideas even around Faraday's ideas of electricity. But by the second half of the 20th century, uh, people just – and people did. They, re- they read a lot of science. They, they, they were interested in this. And you could look at popular magazines and – they would have a lot of essays by scientists in the Atlantic or, or other popular. That sort of drops out, and science becomes an unknown to most people. Yeah. And so they're only working on the trust that scientists believe in. It's only because Einstein said that there's relativity. I trust Einstein. I Only because Bohr um, says something. Only because Watson and Crick discovered it. They don't understand it themselves. Right. And so... Rather than, uh, and more scientists moved out of this educating process, there were less people like E.O. Wilson who could speak to a broad public. Where before, all the great scientists, before Darwin was writing to a popular audience, Wallace was writing, people were reading, every educated person read them, and they were following their arguments. Even people like Eddington and, and, and physicists, people like Maxwell were writing to a broader people. And that dropped out, and so science just became uncomprehendable. I think this, uh, this is, and if you can't comprehend it, you know, I think it's one of the motives for um, Steve Gould's non-overlapping magisteria essay, and then he turned it into a book. In part, I think he was he, he was trying to convey the idea that you know, look, everybody, calm down. Uh, you know, we're going to give you th- these areas of knowledge, and we're going to keep ours over here. We're not a threat. And I liked right. I, I liked the the Noma idea um, when it first came out because you know let's make the peace <laughs> and, and stop this whole warfare model, uh, which is way too simplistic. Um, but then he got pushed back, as you know, Dawkins and others have said. Well, it d- depends on what we're talking about here. I mean, if you say the Earth is six thousand years old and the geologist tells us it's four point six billion years old, these are not non overlapping magister. One of them's right and one of them's wrong, and there's a conflict there. You have to make a decision. And so I guess it depends on where you what particular subject you're addressing. Now, Gould wanted to talk about meaning and morality, 
Well, meaning maybe, but morality, I mean, evolutionary psychologists is a whole industry of a field of study of how the, uh, you know, morals evolved, you know, Franz Duvall's <laughs> research with primates and so on, these pre-moral sentiments are there and, and, uh, you know, so what's left? Well, meaning, well, you know, it's a personal thing, you know, why do we have to get that from God or science? It's just, we just get it from ourselves. So, you know, what's left for religion to do? Other than pragmatically, you know, man, the soup kitchens is a, you know, as a social institution, it's, it has value. But just in terms of the, the epistemological question of what is the realm of science for scientists to deal with? How big is that? And, and where does religion fall in that? And so Steve's efforts there, I think, were, were, were laudable in terms of, uh, of, you know, like just calming people down on this conflict model. But what people like Dawkins want to say is, well, yeah, but, but yeah, that's nice. But, but really what is there for religion to talk about ontologically speaking about the nature of reality? But what, what I think where it came from in Gould is what Gould was so valuable about is he could reach more than anyone. I, I, Wilson has a big audience and, and, and Dawkins has a big audience, but Gould had an amazing audience and he could reach out and tell people about evolution and make it so attractive mm -hmm. and so persuasive. And that's what, honestly, people forget. That's what we think of Charles Darwin as a scientist. But he was in a tremendously effective popularizer. And so was in America, Asa Gray and, uh, and others pushing this um, um, evolution idea. And what we don't have is enough people what Gould did with such ability was reach out to people at their level make a baseball metaphor mm -hmm. and make um evolution seem so in um uh, uh obvious and undeniable and the sense that um the sense that i mean and dawkins where he has sort of been um um, pigeonhole. And so where, where you get a broader range of people who will read, uh, who read Gould. And I think Wilson still has a fairly broad audience. Dawkins got his followers. And so other people don't, he can't reach beyond that group. He's, he's great for energizing that group. And he raises a lot of good points, but, and I love his book, like the selfish gene. It's a fundamental work of American writing. Uh, from that era, but he can't reach out. And therefore we have these vast numbers of people that we're talking about who, who are just disengaged from science. And the only view they get is from people like Ken Ham's answers in Genesis or, mm -hmm. or reading, um, or hearing from their, from a various, um, sources like this. And they're not going to get some other view in anywhere they're going to come in contact with and that with with those people then get entrenched in their viewpoint and Gould to an extent could reach out and I think what he was trying to do with his two overlapping uh, Majerius idea was to push that even further and maybe too far yeah now someone like Richard Dawkins will say that you know if you follow the science carefully you really should end up at atheism which is the very thing that a lot of Christians fear. Like if I send my kid off to college, he's going to run into this line of arguments and then he's going to lose his religion. What do right. you say? What do you say to people like that? Is the, and is, do you think that is the case? If you follow the science far enough, you really should end up as an atheist. Well, and that was, the, by the way, that's the same argument that um, Henry Morris makes. It's the same argument that Philip Johnson made that the same argument that, that, um, that William Jennings Bryan made. Um, if, if, if I often say that if, um, Richard Dawkins didn't exist, the creationists would have to invent him <laughs> right. because he, he literally gives voice to their fears. Right. Uh, I'd say I can understand his argument in theory, but in practice, you know, I'm a historian, I'm not a philosopher. And in practice, it just doesn't happen. Right. You have lots of people who go through, um, college. You have lots of people who become scientists. You have lots of people who take science classes. You have lots of people who believe in evolution and believe in uh, a Darwinian theory of evolution, a, a, a naturalistic theory of evolution, and remain 
Christians. I mean, they may not be um, uh, fundamentalist, right. uh, but they still, uh, they're people like Ken Miller, who, who is an incredible biologist and remains a Catholic. Right. Right. See, in, in, in Ken's cases, you were there for our salon with him. <laughs> Uh, you know, when I pushed him on that, he just said, well, this is what I believe. This is what works for me. It's my background. It, it's what, uh, you know, I, I like. I'm okay. It's really, that's kind of the end of the conversation. I, I have nothing more to push him on or to argue about. Um, you know, some, I, I remember he, I was at a conference with him and Ken, uh, with Ken Miller and Richard Dawkins. And, and Richard was pushing him down this line of, well, if we found a piece of the true cross and there was a little flesh on the true cross, and that was Jesus' flesh. And we did a DNA analysis. You know, what would you find? You know, because it, it should be different. <laughs> you know, and, it, and, it, and I don't think that's the kind of reasoning or line of arguments that Ken would want to go down. Because ultimately, the question of Jesus' divinity and therefore resurrection and so on, that, that's just an article of faith. That's just part of my religious. I just accept it. I'm not claiming that I have good arguments for it or that we're going to find the DNA test that shows it's true. That's in a kind of a different realm of epistemology. Correct. That would be exactly the phrase I'd use for it. A different realm of epistemology. Um, science tells us about nature, not about the supernatural. And that would be the, that would be the approach. That would be the response. And it can come from a variety of sources. It come compartmentalizing that you just compartmentalize these two parts of your life. It can come through um, other ways that you um, you can um, put it together. So my only answer is I understand the full logic of both the way William Jennings Bryan or, or Richard Dawkins would say it, but it's just as a historian, it's just simply not true. Um, it, people are complex. That's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. um, I think you've dealt with enough people to know people are, and we're not purely rational beings. That's one of the things we think more and more that robots are going to be able to do with a, with a very sophisticated artificial intelligence and very sophisticated machine learning abilities. As we push those, we're going to just replace people. Well, the only reason I don't think we are is people are emotional beings. And so, and, uh, and since we're emotional beings, as well as rational beings, um, it, you know, you can have these things that seem logically inconsistent. So you can follow the logic, but in practice, it just doesn't always happen. Well, although you could ground it in a William James style pragmatism. Mm -hmm. in which you define truth in some kind of a pragmatic way that allows you to say, no, no, my, my beliefs are true in this pragmatic right. sense, not in some other sense. Correct. You definitely can follow in, a, James, in, in that line. Um, another analogy that sometimes works when I'm talking to people is I can say, I, my favorite poet happens to be William Wordsworth. I'm just a fanatic for William Wordsworth. Um, always was. Though I find out as I get older, I used to like his poems when he wrote when he was young, and now I love to turn Abbey and the ones he wrote when he was old. And that's why it was so nice he lived so long. And Keats, I no longer, Keats is, I, um, is it, since he died young, I don't relate to him anymore. But the point is, he, he gives us a certain appreciation, as do all the romantics, the row, whoever you want to mention. They have a certain appreciation of what a rainbow is that made his heart leap up, or what daffodils were. Now, that's a very different understanding of daffodils or rainbows than, mm -hmm. than scientists give us. But is it wrong? No, it's not wrong. It's just different. Right. And in that sense, and you can look at one thing we do with this book is on, on, on faith and science. We don't limit it in any way to Christianity. We deal with Buddhism. We deal with Hinduism. We deal with Eastern religions. We deal with, we deal with pantheism. We deal with uh, modern sort of new age spiritualism. We deal with Native American religious movements, feminist religious movements. And see, when you bring all of those in and you break the lines and you're not just talking about the warfare or lack of warfare or the reconciliation or lack of reconciliation between biblical Christianity and, um, um, and science, you see that all these people are coming to different sorts of reconciliations <laughs> in different sorts of ways that combine their faith 
That's why we don't call it Christianity and science. Their faith, because all of them are different faiths, and, and science. And some work reconciliations in one way and some don't. And so it's interesting to follow what Buddhists have to say about evolution. Right. Um, it's a whole different sorts of issues. Now, there are fundamentalist Buddhists, but you know Buddhism is like Hinduism. <laughs> some of them are atheistic, that's more pure to their doctrines. Others are very theistic, and they have all sorts of particular God. And so you'll get different reactions. Same with Islam. Islam tends to be more closed now, at least for the last three centuries, um, than Christianity even. But um, there are certainly elements of Sufi Islam that, that are very, very dynamic and open to these sort of ideas. And of course, historically, uh, if you go back to the Middle Ages, they were more open than the Catholic Church. So all these issues are, um, it, it's a dynamical um, uh, process involving people in all their complexity, and then you throw on top of this, as Ken Miller did, a sense of tradition, a sense of family, a sense of culture um, that he stresses are very important to, to what he brings to, brings to play, and it's, it's, it's how people are. We're yeah, yeah, reading on faith and science, um, it, it's, it just shows you that these taxonomies we create, like same worlds, different worlds, conflicting worlds, there's three different categories you can put people in. No, there's like 20 categories. And, you know, it's nice to have a three-category te taxonomy just because it's easier to sort things out in your head. Uh, but reading your book, and this goes all the way back, you know, thousands of years, not not just, you know, decades or, or a century or two, or even back to Galileo. This is, you know, Galileo was new compared to some of these ancient uh, debates. And um, so that's, you know, one of the values of reading your book is, is kind of head spinning of the number of different positions people have staked out on these uh, kinds of issues. Um, yeah. yeah, there was a great play, um, I'm trying to think who it was, Greek play called The Clouds, which has Socrates. And the troubles that Socrates runs into because he's teaching science, as it were, if we want to update it, and the people believed in the gods. And you could take that. I'd taken that play in a presentation once uh, when I was making a presentation and simply read it and then talked about a bunch of things and then re-put it by putting Darwin in the it, – it, <laughs> Socrates is in a balloon carried aloft. And I just changed the characters – and it works just as well today. Right, right. As a popular play played in uh, in Athens, um, what would that be? Three thousand years. Ago? Right. Yeah. So reading the Bible as literature, as poetry, or metaphorically, or psychologically true, or whatever, is very different from reading it, you know, as a science book or as a literal history book. Um, when uh, I got to know Frank Tipler pretty well, and I wrote about him in, in my first book, Why People Believe Weird Things, and then I updated it in my latest book, Heavens on Earth. Just Oh, I love that book, by the way. Your new book, I've been reading it. Oh, thank you. For the last three weeks, I am going to base, if you don't mind, I'm going to draw on your arguments in a chapter of a book I'm working on, because I just love it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, but, you know, like Tipler's arguments that, you know, the resurrection, how did this happen? Well, Jesus' body turned into neutrinos, and then he had this neutrino beam that lifted him up to heaven. It's like, oh, my gosh. And it reminds me, we, we get submitted to Skeptic Magazine periodically articles um, attempting to uh, explain biblical miracles by some natural phenomenon, like you know, maybe there was a, you know, maybe there was a meteor strike or a volcanic eruption or the sea parted because of this earthquake. Or three planets are brought in alignment yeah, and yeah. create star of Bethlehem. Right, exactly. We had one that we actually published because this whole thing about Jesus on the cross and he was sort of semi comatose. And then when they did the stab in the side, it actually had this me this medication on it that 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 knocked him out and it looked like he was dead. And, it, and there's these chemicals you can do that simulate death, but the person's actually still alive and he can live for three days in the tomb. And this goes on and on. It's like maybe there's nothing to explain. Maybe it's, it's just a story. You know, and it's like, like like trying to explain the Star Wars story or or, or whatever. Uh, you know, there's, you're missing the point of the story by trying to explain it that way. You know, so that in that sense, we can think of these biblical stories of maybe this is part of the non-overlapping peacemaking movement. That yes, those stories are true. It's sort of like a Jordan Peterson kind of thing. They're true for 
for, for social purposes or personal psychological purposes to improve your life. You should read these stories or these myths, the whole panoply of myths. Not as literally true. Forget that. It's like, what does it mean for you in your life? Like, I got to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning, right? The reason to be nice to people or whatever. And these stories help me structure my life. Um, it's a little bit like maybe analogously, um, you know, stages theory in psychology, like the five stages of death and dying, Kubler Ross's theories. You know, now we know that this is a bunch of baloney, that people don't go through five stages or they skip the stages or they go backwards in the stages. But, you know, in a way, it, it's just the, the taxonomy is just a way of thinking about a subject. We just have to have words and, and a way to talk about things. So it has value in that. If you push too far into it, you can see that it's, it's not true, but it's a way of talking about things. What, what do you think about that? That's sort of that pragmatic aspect of truth. Uh, that that scientists often miss because they're thinking too literally about claims, whereas maybe the claims are just metaphorically true or psychologically true or something like that. I think there's a long history of that viewpoint. That Saint Augustine said in his Confessions, I think it was in his Confessions, that he originally thought all this Bible stuff. His mother was apparently very religious, um, was a bunch of hooey, and he went on with his very secular life. And then it was only the um, the teachings of oh what was his name Ambrose the bishop of the bishop of Milan who led him to believe that hey you can take all this Bible stuff as typological or metaphorical and you don't have to believe that Jonah was in the whale for three days it was just a a, a lesson they taught to foretell Jesus being in the tomb for three days things like that and therefore. You can you can draw lessons from it, and you can <laughs> view it in that way. And I um, so and if Saint Augustine, I believe, is considered one of the key founders of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, now they have some pretty hardcore um, some of their founders who who were very literalistic as well. But they got Saint Augustine right there, and so I do think that 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 you can view this in in many ways. And you, of course, you get process theology with Whitehead who was also a great scientist, as you said, with James. There are just a whole multitude of ways, and that was all coming to the fore right when the creation evolution controversy exploded. These people were working in the 1920s, 1910s, 1900s, 18, 1890s, and this was what, and as these ideas come out and come out in the seminaries, then you get the kickback. So the creation evolution controversy in America actually did not start in the schools. It was Brian who carried it in the schools. It started in the seminaries, in the mm. pulpit, with the fundamentalist leaders or the evangelical leaders not wanting, not wanting modernism, not wanting these alternative theories, not wanting process theology, not wanting all these ideas seeping into the seminaries or in their pulpits. And among them, Darwinism, if you read that early literature, Darwinism is not the number one thing. It's way down the list, but it's one of the things they're throwing out that we don't want. We want to believe in Adam and Eve. And so what Ryan did with his typical progressive thought is he took that, applied what was already being said about the, the, the seminaries. He had took that to public school um, after World War One. So. It was in many ways these, and then he focused on Darwinism rather than because you're going to teach Darwinism in school, you're not going to teach right heads process theology in public. <laughs> right. um, and so that, and um, of course, it didn't happen until you'd only teach Darwinism even in high school, and really before 1910, there weren't many high schools. Most there was compulsory education was limited to eighth grade, and it was only really in the first two decades, three decades of 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 America of the 20th century that you started having the spread of mandatory public high school. You had, they were isolated before. And it was only then that Darwinism started creeping into the schools to be fought anyway. Right. Well, in part, I guess that would be because there wasn't a, a big public school, uh, public education funded by the government program in the 19th century. It just wasn't very extensive at all. Well, it was limited to eighth grade. Yeah. To yeah, one of my you favorite. You things like Boston Latin, though. It's, it's interesting that Darwin's always tagged here. One of my favorite quotes from Darwin, uh, 
he wrote in a letter to a, a correspondent, it appears to me, whether rightly or wrongly, that direct arguments against Christianity and theism produce hardly any effect on the public, and freedom of thought is best promoted by the gradual eliminate, illumination of men's minds which follow from the advance of science. And then he added, uh, I may, however, have been unduly biased by the pain which it would give some members of my family if I aided in any way direct attacks on religion. So he was clearly, you know, not interested in in promulgating his own theories uh, about for for its implications against religion at all. In part, I, I think because Emma, his wife, was so religious, mm -hmm. you know, keep the peace at home is certainly understandable. But but I think publicly, he just didn't think that was a good strategy. Even though he appears to be an have been an agnostic in, in the way that Huxley meant it, that it's just an unknowable concept uh, ultimately. Mm -hmm. I agree. That's a great point. And one I would add to it, another line, and um, I probably will not quote it exactly, though I've quoted it often in my books. He said that I really don't care that much whether people believe my theory of natural selection. What I care about is whether they believe in common descent, hmm. that, that, that they believe in evolution. And that's the main thing. My method of natural and that that's statement. Um, he and I think that might have been to Huxley, but he, he he believed that very firmly. That is, he wasn't since he didn't have a theory of genetics. There wasn't yet the neo-Darwinian synthesis. He, you know, the theory of natural selection. The advantage of his theory of natural selection. People had been thinking about evolution for years. It's estimated that most of the teachers where he first went to college in Edinburgh were evolutionists. They were Lamarckians, and that a third of the scientists in Western Europe were Lamarckian evolutionists before Darwin wrote. What he made by giving a plausible theory of how it worked, because Lamarck's was always rather crazy, um, but there was already the evidence of common descent. He became persuaded by common descent. Wallace went off. Wallace was a convinced evolutionist before he went off to Brazil. What he was trying to do was to find evidence that would support it, and then later on, in a malarial fever, hit upon the idea of natural selection. Natural selection at least gave a method, but for most people in the late 20th century, late 19th century, for most scientists in the late 19th century, they weren't so sure whether Darwinism, that is, the theory of natural selection, worked, but they became totally convinced in common descent. Mm -hmm. Darwin and when Huxley famously write that you will have the rare pleasure of your idea becoming triumphant in your lifetime, mm -hmm. which is very different than Galileo or Newton or Copernicus. You will have that rare place. He meant evolution, not natural selection. Oh, right. He never totally bought it. Huxley himself never totally bought natural selection. So if you, coupled with what the quote you read of Darwin, and add this observation, of course he's not going to push the agnostic aspects because he knew full well that one of the com strong competing versions of evolution that was gaining widespread ex acceptance with a whole variety of people, including Asa Gray in America, but um, Minaret in, in, in England, for example, and many people in France, was a theistic form of evolution that totally accepted common descent, but God was somehow involved in it. And so... He had no grounds for necessarily taking his science, the grounds you'd have after the Neo-Darwinian synthesis became dominant. He had no grounds for using his science to definitely push either agnosticism or atheism. And so he didn't. Of course, whenever anybody tried to cite him as an atheist, he rejected that. He says, I'm not an atheist, I'm an agnostic. But still, both what you said, keeping the home happy, his own questions and thoughts, his own personality. He was a conflict avoider, all the things you said, but also the fact that he was mostly pushing the idea of evolution, not in, and, and less certain about the natural selection. And it's natural selection that people like, I believe, the way I understand Richard Dawkins, it's, and I too like him, it's more the theory of natural selection than the idea of common descent that leads one inexorably, in his view, toward mm -hmm. agnosticism. Mm -hmm.
We spent a lot of time on on evolution. Let's let's turn to another chapter in your book on the that 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 is one of these memes in the in the conflict model of science and religion that Galileo triumphed over the church and this was a great uh, victory for science and, and, and an embarrassment for the church and so on. The story is, you know, way more complicated and interesting than that. It is, uh, but still, there is no better read than. Um, in the middle of it, Galileo's brilliant letter to the to the um, Christina. What is she? Uh, um, I should have this in mind. She's some uh, his letter where he explains has that wonderful line. The Bible's not uh, tells us how to um, um, go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Right. Which <laughs> is it's so brilliant. Um, and um, uh, it was a it, it it became it was big at the time. Uh, it was complicated. It was messy, but it was big at the time because uh, Galileo was is, was a huge in his own day. Yeah. And the fact that the church put him under house arrest was a major issue, um, both in the Catholic, but especially in, in newly formed Protestant countries would point to that and say, <laughs> look, what people are doing. But it was a very uh, 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 but it was a very complicated issue because um uh, you could argue that he had agreed not to do it. He was embarrassing the Pope, but I, I tend to take Galileo's side on it. He was, um, um, he had a, he had a good argument and he stated it well. Mm -hmm. And I don't think sure. He made the Pope look a little foolish in the making him simpl simpl simplicity <laughs> in his dialogue, but it was dang good, um, um, polemics and with good science to back it up. But it was complicated because you didn't have the definitive proofs that we have now. You the the, the phases of Venus, sure, that was pretty convincing, um, but the telescopes weren't very good that day, and and other people could look through with their biases and not see those phases so clearly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. other things, the fact that there was still no parallax, the 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 people holding to the idea of a circular earth at the center of the universe with the sun going around had a lot of counter arguments, um, uh, counter arguments to make. So it was a messy story and we try to capture it in its full richness then, but it's ongoing, um, um, polemical significance ever since, because it has always been worldwide, uh, uh object lesson number one in the right. uh, supposed warfare of science and religion. One of my favorite Gould essays is the one he wrote about um, Galileo and Saturn and how, you know, he wrote, it, it, so Gould translates it from, from Galileo's original writing that, you know, I have observed that, the, that, the, that Saturn is three planets, it's three bodies. And it's like, well, no, you, you couldn't have observed that. That's what you're seeing in your mind's eye. The data is not too good because it telescope's kind of crappy and and there's no theory of planetary rings so you have a problem of data and theory and mm -hmm. and yet still galileo makes that leap uh, this is what i saw it's three bodies mm -hmm. and uh, and gould showed how he you know kind of went from i'm not sure what it is from night to night it's different and then okay i've now i've seen it clearly now it's three bodies you know so it's another great example that, that gould always used of the the influence of theory and culture on so-called objective scientific data, which isn't always objective. And you see that that's certainly true with Galileo and his critics um, within the church, the, the most sophisticated of the Jesuit critics were, were very knowledgeable and their counter arguments were, had a, a lot of basis they were, they were raising all the points that anyone would make that the earth should be stationary because the idea had gone all the way back to the, the battles between the um, Pythagorean and Aristotle and everybody knew those battles, at least not everybody, but these sophisticated intelligent people like, um, like Copernicus and, 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 and Galileo and, and the Jesuits and they bannered him back and forth. I mean, Copernicus and Galileo both cited what the old, um, Pythagoreans said and the evidence they gave and the other side could bring back Aristotle and Aristotle was of course not a theist so um, he was <laughs> right. an atheist and yet he held firm to a circular earth at the center of the universe with uh, with planets going around it and so you have 
you 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 do have a a rich and um, a rich debate to draw on, much richer than the simple presentation. And we love the richness, but still, it doesn't justify one side throwing the other person in house arrest. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That part's true. And, uh, and and Gould always wanted that quote to be true that he made popular that that Galileo said, and yet it moves anyway. Uh, yeah. I, right. I, that that is a that's a, a wonderful line that I think goes back way before Gould, but there's no basis in reality yeah, to, right. that I know of in that. Yeah. So let's talk about um, the current situation that we're in with the relationship of science and religion. Um, uh, by way of talking about Dawkins' book, The the God Delusion, you know, he, he had shopped that around. We have the same agent, uh, John Brockman, in the 90s. And, uh, you know, Brockman felt like, well, there's not a lot of interest in this. And, you know, because there had been many books on atheism, like George mm-hmm. Smith's uh, classic work on, in which he outlines all the arguments for theism and all the counter arguments for atheism. And, and, you know, it's so there wasn't a lot new in Richard's book in 2006. And yet that's the timing seemed to be, uh, is what made it launched it. Not in addition to Richard being a great writer, he's a beautiful writer and a clear thinker. Uh, but there's more to it than that. I think the time was right that it, what wasn't right maybe in the nineties or eighties for atheism as a thing to become a thing. Uh, what, 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 what do you think? How do you say, is it nine 11, you know, concerns about, you know, extreme religion going too far or, or what? I, I think you, you've hit on it honestly. And I, and I can't really add to what you say because you've thought about this even more than I did. Um, Dawkins book to me when I read it and I'm a Dawkins fan in the sense that I think selfish gene uh, I don't think anybody creates better titles for his book, Climbing Mount Improbable. I mean, yeah. what a collection of books. Blind watchmaker, so yeah. He had a long history of people who would read whatever he wrote. It's like Steven Pinker. I mean, how can you not look forward to another book by Steven Pinker? And how can you not look forward to a, another book by Richard Dawkins? Personally, I had the same reaction that you said his editor had or, or publisher or whoever it was, the one you were describing, that this just wasn't, in my opinion, wasn't of the sophistication or interest or or stimulus i didn't get much new there where i got so much new out of sort of captured i mean i knew bill hamilton's ideas before selfish gene um and i i was influenced by them but boy when selfish gene just like brilliant um according to richard dawkins himself i believe from his television version um it was 9 11 that inspired him when he saw that 9 11 that Islamic fundamentalism could lead to the attack on the Twin Towers. This is the way I remember it from his television series. That that helped inspire him to write the book. And I think that helped, therefore, inspire the response. He was, he, he was a, he's a gifted writer. He had an established following, but the timing was right for this particular book. And as you say... <laughs> it took off. There were others about the same time. Sam Harris was about the same time. time. Uh, And and Hitch with his God is not great. And Dan Bennett's book. Yeah. So there did seem to be a cultural zeitgeist for these things to land. And now we've seen, of course, the rise of the nuns, you know, the the fastest growing religious cohort in America, the people that tick the box for no religious affiliation. This seems Mm -hmm. to be a worldwide phenomenon, at least in Western countries, Um, which leads to some people like myself in my activist mode to say, well, this is going to this trend will continue and and eventually religion will fall into disuse and we'll all be secular humanists. And in in my historian of science mode, I'm thinking, oh, that's you're dreaming, Shermer. This is just not going to happen. I mean, religion, uh, you know, has such a role in so many people's lives that they're just not going to give that up no matter how appealing we try to make enlightenment humanism or or push the idea that we believe in rights and 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 so forth there's still something else religion seems to provide to people that that may not ever be replaced by secular movements well i see i agree with you um on all points you've made um i i see and i this is just the total i've never i've never done any extensive research on it but I tend to see that rise of the nuns, as you call it, in America, especially among younger college educated people as a reaction to the politicization of religion, mm. um, not to religion itself. In the 60s, when I was young, the there was the Jesus movement. 
that people went to Christianity, um, it, it was very much social gospel. It was very much um, anti-Vietnam War. It was it was it was huggy feely. It was love, um, and uh, some aspects of Christianity were, were meshed up in that society. You didn't view Nixon pushing Christianity, but then when you when a lot of these people see a linkage between evangelical Christians, because remember back then, most evangelical Christians voted for Jimmy Carter. He right. won the right. vote of the fundamentalist evangelical Christian. And so you didn't see that link up, but it was only began to see this link up. I mean, you sure you had Billy Graham seemed to be a friend of Nixon, but he was also a friend of Lynn Johnson. He just seemed to be an establishment character. Right now with beginning with Reagan, who was not, think particularly religious himself, you began to see, the and the moral majority, a realignment of not mainline Christianity, but this evangelical fundamentalist Christianity with Republican, um, uh, conservative Republicanism. And then you see it, saw it more with George W. Bush, not so much with George Herbert Walker Bush, who was, uh, but George W. Bush. And then that led to the Iraq war and people. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now with Trump and the way that evangelical Christians are lockstep voting and supporting Trump, that linkage, I think, alienates a lot of young people, mm -hmm. especially. Um, and so when you have a politicization of the church, when the church seems to be a vehicle for fundamentalist Christianity um, and fundamentalist Christianity seems to be a vehicle for the Republican doctrine, and this Republican doctrine looks so harsh. Right. And so non-loving and separating babies at the border and stuff like that. Right, right. I think that helps lead to the movement in the United States. And it may push us more toward um, the situation in Western Europe. But if you where you do see a really decline in, in, in Christian adherence. But if you instead push this beyond, and this is where I'm agreeing with you, too. So I see that's the scenario that's happening, the rise of the, nun, the nuns, as opposed to the effect of Dawkins' book, or the influence of uh, teaching evolution. I don't see it coming from that. <coughs> then you look worldwide, and you see <coughs> the enormous expansion of fundamentalist Christianity in sub-Saharan Africa. The explosion of evangelical churches in South Korea, mm -hmm. the growth of evangelical Christianity in the in the in South America, uh, and the conservative shift of much of Catholicism in South America. You see the explosion of, of a militant Hinduism in India. You see the rise of a uh, of a more uh, the seeming spread of religiosity in the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. I was just over lecturing in um, Singapore. Mm. Of course, not when he was. Um, because they were having a conference on creationism because the two countries on their side, they're not a Islamic country, but the two countries on each side of them, Indonesia and Malaysia are, and they don't let people teach evolution. Turkey just banned the teaching of evolution. Right. To and a red is more religion, pushing religion. So you see that if you see this rise of religion in the world, Hungary, Poland, even Russia seem to be getting more religious. Um, and, um, Whatever is happening in in um, in uh, 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 the old um, Burma, um, oh Min uh, Myanmar, in Myanmar, um, would seem the rise of some some sort of a militant Buddhism. Right. So in all these countries, you see religion on the rise. Right. And so it's hard to think that <laughs> secular humanism is winning. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> and, you know, given that we're about to colonize Mars, you wonder what, what kind of what, what religion is going to evolve over the next thousand years on Mars or some other planets. Yeah. I mean, so do, do you have some thoughts on that? Why, why are people religious? Why do people believe in God? Is, is this part of our our DNA, so to speak? It's just it's in our in our minds to find intentional agency out there and label it with, you know, something uh, like godlike. I've often viewed people, <laughs> if you want to define them, I'm trying to think what was Aristotle's definition of a human, uh, two-legged, rational, they had a certain definition. 
and I think it's it, it's people with a sense of uh, uh, animals with a sense of purpose. Mm-hmm. That is animals a sense of meaning, that a quest for meaning. That that we're unlike dolphins or elephants, which may be smarter than we are. They don't have this sense of this type of consciousness that we have in this quest for meaning, and it may be this 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 innate quest for meaning in our lives that gave us an evolutionary leg up. It may be why we could wipe out the elephants and, mm-hmm. and dolphins, whales, nearly wipe out the whales, doing a pretty good job on the elephants, or a pretty bad job, whatever you want to call it, um, on the elephants. So in other words, you would side more on the adaptive, just, adaptive functional purpose of religion rather than it's a spandrel. Well, it could, right, it could well be that it's, it, it, because what seems to be fundamental is, is we want to have meaning, and religion does give give meaning. Now, there's a lot of adaptive advantages to it. It gives reason why we might want to raise young because we're called to, or otherwise, you know, we if we just own personal enjoyment, we wouldn't want to do that. There's could be you could look at a lot of different things, but to me, more than rational beings, we are beings in search of meaning, and and religion gives meaning now. Science can give meaning to some people. I think it gives meaning to Richard Dawkins, um, but science, and it gives meaning to, you know, you, historically, you can throw out a lot of people that would be a lot of scientists and a lot of public intellectuals that, that, that do get meaning out of science, but it doesn't seem to trickle down to everyone. And, uh, and so if it doesn't serve quite that purpose, and that's where... We were talking about Gould earlier. That's where his writings were so wonderful, and and Wallace's writings were so wonderful. Alfred Russell Wallace's writings um, were so wonderful, and a people could get a sense of of purpose and and place from from science the way it was presented. I think he, Galileo even had that knack, and that's what made him so threatening to the church. Mm-hmm. So I think that may come from our. Are the very nature of who we are. Do you have an opinion on uh, group selection as a theory in general, and then its application to explaining religion? As you know, there's one track that says you know, the adaptive function of religion is that it's group, group cohesiveness, and therefore groups hu- groups of humans that were religious had a one up on the on the on the non-religious groups, I guess, in terms of their unity. Good question. I, I'm not a scientist, but I have always had. Um, I've read an enormous amount of Darwin, and I've read a enormous amount by scientists, and I've always had a, 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 a an affection, uh, and I should call it that, uh, for group group selection. I've always thought that it it made sense to me in the way Darwin presented, especially in Descent of Descent of Man, and um, it and it seemed that you needed. Individual selection, you needed groups, you needed, you needed natural selection, you needed group selection, and you needed uh, sexual selection. Um, and I was pleased when um, off he came, um, uh, uh, E.O. Wilson comes back to group selection yeah. because it just seems to be necessary. And it may be as much as anybody that, Dar- that Darwin persuaded me of that. Um, and it may not be right. I know that I know that's very important to um, to. Uh, um, David Dawkins and to Stockton. others no. that's not me there um, and Bill Hamilton and I have enormous respect for these people but it certainly does a magnificent job of explaining the persistence of religion right so I've read quite a bit of your writings um, you're always very careful to keep your personal uh, beliefs out of there which is good uh, but I'm, I'm curious do you want to tell us uh, you know what do you call yourself a atheist agnostic uh, evolutionary theist or whatever and uh, and where do you fall on these the, the, the science and religion issues and, and, and as a, not as a historian but maybe as an activist or or uh, someone engaged in in the world and, and you have to say this is what I believe and or whatever well as an activist to the extent I'm an activist I of course, I'm an activist for good science education in the public schools. That's why I would, um, I've always been a supporter of National Center for Science Education. Right. Um, Eugenie Scott's work. Um, I was pleased to get their Friends of Darwin Award. <laughs> I care deeply about um, the quality of science. I'm also a deep believer in, in critical theory. I did not grow up in a, a religious household uh, myself, but I also don't, don't talk about those issues about myself because I am 
fundamentally not an evangelical in any sense. Um, I believe that science is the best method, that the scientific method is the best method for understanding the natural world. Um, but I'm not a evangelical, so I'll, so I'll push that. I think the public schools, I'm a big, as a, as a, as a lawyer, I'm a, uh, I take a strict separationist viewpoint. I'm a, I'm like Hugo Black. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a, I, I strongly believe in an absolute separation of church and state. I do not, because probably because, partly because I'm not an evangelical. I don't believe the government, uh, I believe religion is very personal and I don't believe government should be pushing it. I don't think they, um, they uh, should be pushing a particular religious view or defending one. And, uh, but you're not an and atheist I'm either. Just pulling away from that. So for all those reasons, I tend not to not to um, um, talk about those issues and try to try to avoid being a um, a um, um, being put in a in a in a position where I'm trying to defend um, whatever I might. <laughs> whatever I might believe and and mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't hold them in ways that that I think that any particular view is necessary to be a rich fulfilled um, human being uh, and uh, uh, any uh, I, I see I see um, um, good people on on both sides and I see bad people on both sides mm -hmm. but you don't call yourself an atheist either no, I don't. I'm, I I certainly would not call myself an atheist. I I am sympathetic, uh, uh, and I am open. I'm uh, I, I believe in the in a spiritual side, but I don't believe it in any way um, as a as something that science can or should investigate. Right. So maybe uh, in a way, uh, I just wrote a, one of my columns on Scientific American. I think it comes out this week on Mysterianism. Um, that you know, there's certain mysteries that it, it's not that we haven't explained them yet because they're so hard, like consciousness, that they're inherently unexplainable. Like you know, what what's beyond the natural, the supernatural? You can't get there through the natural world or free will or consciousness is the other two. Uh, you know, where the laws of nature come from, you know, they, you know right. th these are words we use to describe things or equations, but th they're not out there in, as words or equations in nature anywhere. It's just nature doing nature's thing. Well, why is it like that? You know, at some point you just hit a wall going all the way back, you know, why the universe is structured the way it is. I think that must leave some room epistemologically speaking, for people to stake out different positions without being inconsistent or illogical or unscientific, certainly. When I look back as a historian, and this definitely comes through the book on faith and, um, on faith and science, there are lots of ways that people deal with this issue. So you get quite a few very, very prominent scientists um, whether it be James Clerk Maxwell mm -hmm. or Michael Faraday, I mean, those are there's no two more important scientists <laughs> for the 20th century than those those two people because mm -hmm. they worked out all the laws that led to all of engineering Everything. and <laughs> modern technology, yeah. electric engineering. Um, James um, um, and, and you could certainly add. Um, uh, well, I guess he'd be a little more fundamental. So let's stick with those. They. Um, they definitely believed, they were definitely mm -hmm. Christians, and they definitely believed, um, found what they found. And you could say the same thing about Newton. You could probably say the same thing about Galileo, mm -hmm. and Caper maybe Copernicus, that the one thing that they believed that this is an orderly world, and they believed it was an orderly world because it had a creator, and therefore... They're, they weren't looking for God in nature. They weren't doing anything like the creationists were doing. But they believed there was an order in nature because there was a God who created it. It was an orderly God. Uh, Kepler would have said the same thing. And therefore, they were trying to use a scientific method to find out what that order was. But boy, when they saw it, somebody like a Kepler said, yeah, yeah, that third law. My gosh, that's the way God designed it. Right. Uh, and so 
in that sense, you get quite a few scientists who are doing, you know, historically, some of the most significant sciences in the Western tradition, who are very seriously um, bringing Christianity to doing, or religious views, spiritual views. Those views did not limit what they saw. Right. Um, but neither were they now, using you these. People, but it did, like Boyle, but did limit what they saw. But those people who did limit what they saw still could 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 um, it was it was in some way their view of a of an organized creation that helped inspire their work. Right. But neither were they using science to try to prove God. It, it was just a secondary sort of implications. Or if you pushed them on the deeper issues, they would say, yeah, there's an order to it. And it's probably because God created an orderly world. But they weren't like modern day creationists, you know, using their science oh. to, you know, to some religious agenda. There were some of them, like Descartes sometimes, or or certainly Lord Kelvin at times, would cross that line and try to show their Christianity was, that their science was proving a particular type of God. But in general, the ones I'm talking about, um, with with Faraday or Maxwell, um, you have people who, who they're, um, and I think Ben Franklin, um, I think mm-hmm. you can a lot of people like this, who... Who, who their spiritual views, um, their idea that there was an orderly universe helped inspire the right. science of doing. And in that sense, there was a compatibility, a sort of a complex compatibility, but in one that they didn't think, none of them thought that the Bible was giving them the preordained answers, which right. makes right. mentally different. Right. Right. Yeah, yep. yep. Well, Ed, we've been going about almost an hour and a half here, and uh, so let's wrap it up and uh, thank you for writing such a great book. Again, to our audience on faith and science, you and uh, Michael Ruse. I haven't talked to Michael in, in quite a while. I always enjoyed his writings as well. And uh, Yale University Press, it's a, it's a really, it's a perfect encapsulation of the whole big picture, all the way from the ancient Greeks and to, to uh, last week and, and all around the world. And uh, so this definitely broadened my understanding of that whole, uh, uh, that whole relationship between science and religion. Uh, so thank you for doing that. Good job. What's well, the next book? Thank you. We we had we had um, um, we were looking that there was a gap in the literature that we didn't necessarily think were profound, but that there wasn't a good primer. We didn't know to use in schools, using using college ca- classes, or just for individuals that gave a broad, encompassing view. There's some that are just Christianity and science. Um, there were some that were pushing an agenda. But we thought there was a general prime. If people could read a general primer, and then in the back, we try to give a huge laundry list of people you can read, like Dawkins. Many mm-hmm. of Dawkins' books, some of your books, mm-hmm. are put there in the back. Um, other ones by Whitehead or different people that they can read to try to follow up on how these different routes go. Um, and um, follow up, you said the next book. I just brought out a book um, called um, uh, "To the um, To the Edges of the Earth." That's about early exploration, um, early night, early 20th century exploration, um, pushing these people like Shackleton, uh, oh, who are right. pushing Perry, uh, <laughs> the Duke of the Abruzzi, uh, Nansen, who are pushing the edges of the frontier. And it includes a discussion uh, which The New York Times just picked up with last week on the what they said in the review last week was they love the way that it, it they especially love the way that it brought out the religious motivations of these people um, <laughs> or lack of them. Um, none of them were conventional Christians. Some of their assistants were. Many of them were providentialists. Um, some of them were outright um, atheists or agnostics. But how that drove them to explore nature. Mm. And of course, I'm interested in that subtext. So I I try to bring that out in the story. So I hope it's a gripping good good read. Well, good. I'll look forward to reading that. And uh, and it's nice to know somebody at Pepperdine. I'd love to teach at Pepperdine again. I don't think they'd have me, but <laughs> but I had uh, very good experiences there. It was fairly religious at the time. We, we had to go to chapel twice a week, and um, I took courses in the Old Testament, New Testament, the life of Jesus. I took a course from a, a professor named Tony Ash, Anthony Ash, who was just a great professor there on the writings of C.S. Lewis. So we read everything he wrote, including his science fiction works and the children's books. And uh, and he wrote a book. Well, he didn't really write a book about when his wife died. He wrote a book called uh, just his notes uh, that were put together as a book after he died called A, a Grief Observed. And it's right. one of the deepest, most thoughtful things I've ever read. 
Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, it was it was great. Uh, there was no dancing allowed on campus at the time. I understand that's changed now. <laughs> yeah, there's no there's no requirement you be a Christian to come here or to teach here. And um, so it's probably and I'm sure there's I don't know about dancing. I assume there's dancing. Like, <laughs> no, I know there's dancing on campus because it happens down in the in the president's um, uh, when he has the freshmen here at the beginning, I know they have a, big, a rock band and, and there's there's so I'm sure there's dancing. Okay, <laughs> uh, but it is still in view of the beach. Yeah, that's, that's always right. Been one of the big appeals. Of it. Absolutely, totally great. Well, Ed, thanks so much for the great conversation. Really appreciate that, and uh, I'll let you know when we post this. Thank you for having me on the show. It's always great to see you. I hope Likewise. we can get some more of you. We we will get together. I'll come to Malibu. You come to Santa Barbara. <laughs> We're living <Agreed>. the dream. <laughs> Agreed. All right. Thanks, Ed. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.